let's see, what are we into this now? Is this fifth week, sixth week? I'm not keeping up with it, but I'm sure somebody is. One of the things that, uh, that uh, the questions that, that you face as, as a new pastor comes to town um, is, will the church grow? What, what's going to happen? And uh, so I want to talk on a little bit this morning. I'll talk about when God's not in. I think we've got a little video here to get what you think of what. time I, I've, I've talked to a whole lot of pastors and in the course of getting a master's degree I've read a whole lot of books and done a whole lot of research on how to grow a church I've heard all kinds of different opinions on, on, on church growth and, and some people say to do this and some people say to do that I talked to a dear sweet man one time and, and he related to me as accounts of how he went to this church and he said man everything was just great everything was going great everything we did you know seemed to work for the church and the church just grew you know from like 100 people to like 700 people or whatever I can't remember the exact numbers now but but uh, he sensed that it was time to go and, and move on and uh and he did, and he went to another church that was similar to his first experience, and he says, we did all the same things that we did there. And it didn't work. So I don't think there's any kind of magic formula on what will work and, and what will, won't work. I see the biggest problem for churches is that too many churches try to do things on their own. They use man's logic. Now, man's logic is not always bad, but they try to come up with a formula or, or, or a tactic that, that's going to cause growth in the church, and then they just do it. And many times these people never put God at the center of what they're trying to do. When that occurs, Usually their efforts fail. Now, I, I know that I share an opinion, and probably some of you do too, that, that there are churches all over the country that seem to grow that don't have God at the center. But I assure you that there's a judgment day coming for some of those pastors who focus more on finances than on a spiritual journey with God. The story that we're about to read comes from a, a turbulent time in the history of Israel. 
And, and the Philistines had once again rose up against the Israelites. And, and, and in the first part of the chapter, Israel had suffered a, a, a crushing defeat against the Philistines. And, and, and of course, the first one they blamed is God, of course. And who else should they blame? So they decided that God must not be with them in the battle. So they, so they proposed to, to, to bring the Ark of the Covenant to the battle in hopes that God would give them a victory. So this is where we pick up the story. It's 1 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 4. <coughs> so the people sent men to Shiloh, and they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came into the camp, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Here in the uproar, the Philistines asked, What's all this shouting in the Hebrew camp? When they learned that the Ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. A god has come into the camp, they said. Oh no! Nothing like this has happened before. We're doomed. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Be strong, Philistines. Be men, or you'll be subject to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and the Israelites were defeated, and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The ark of God was captured, and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. That same day, a Benjamite ran from the battle line and went to Shiloh with his clothes torn and dust on his head. When he arrived, there was Eli sitting in his chair by the side of the road, watching because his heart feared for the ark of God. When the man entered the town and told what had happened, the whole town set up a cry. Eli heard the outcry and asked, What is the meaning of this uproar? The man hurried over to Eli, who was 98 years old and whose eyes had failed so that he could not see. He told Eli, I have just come from the battle line. I fled from it this very day. Eli asked, What happened, my son? The man who brought the news replied, Israel fled before the Philistines and the army has suffered heavy losses. Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the Ark of God has been captured. When he mentioned the Ark of God, Eli fell backward off his chair by the side of the gate. His neck was broken, and he died, for he was an old man, and he was heavy. He had led Israel 40 years. His daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant and near the time of delivery. When she heard the news that the Ark of God had been captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she went into labor and gave birth, but was overcome by her labor pains. As she was dying, the woman attending her, the woman attending her said, Don't despair, you have given birth to a son. But she did not respond or pay any attention. She named the boy Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel because of the capture of the ark of God and the deaths of her father-in-law and her husband. She said, The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. <clears throat> I see at least three mistakes here by Israel that they made as we seek to be a church that's driven by God's vision. First off, they thought an object could bring them victory. It says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have received from God? You are not your own. Now, you probably heard me say just since I've been here, I'm so thankful for this beautiful church. It's, it's, it, it's a beautiful building should all be proud of it. I, I didn't have any part in planning it or, or, or building it, but I'm just as proud of it as you are. It, it's a wonderful facility for us to gather. I, I, I think anyone who visits might be quite surprised when they come in, you know, and, and, and look at everything. 
I can't say enough good things about, about what we have here. But having said all that, God doesn't live here. You know, we talked at one time about maybe putting security cameras in, in, in the halls. We could run security cameras all we want, but we're not going to see J Jesus traipsing up and down the halls when we all go home. There's nothing about this place that's holy. We should respect it. We should be good stewards. We should do our best to take care of it. But the facility or any aspect of this facility has no powers to control our lives. The Israelites made the first mistake when they brought the Ark of the Covenant to the battlefield and, and, and thought, now we'll be victorious because God will be with us. They, they viewed the Ark of the Covenant as, as almost like some lucky talisman that, that, that had some, some powers to, to help them win the battle. Yes, sir, we get that, when we get that Ark here, we'll go into battle. We'll be unstoppable. This is God's temple. My body. Your body. That's God's temple. God lives in here. God lives in my heart. God lives in your heart. He lives in a structure of flesh and blood that He formed. Many people think that they can grow the church by, by building this magnificent structure. Also, the Israelites substituted exuberance for prayer. Our scripture tells us when the Ark of the Covenant was brought into the camp, the Israelites were cheering so much that the ground shook. That just happened the other day. Yeah, you know, you keep up with the World Cup and the soccer, you know, and all that. So down there in Mexico, they were cheering on the soccer team so loud that it actually set off seismographs in the ground that, that monitor for earthquakes. I, I'm sure if there had been sensors on the ground there, the Israelites would have set them off. Even the Philistines heard the shouting from their camp, and they were afraid. Now, now there's nothing wrong with being excited at the presence of the Lord and, and, and excited to come to church, and, and we, we should all do that. But do you think that's the way that the Israelites should have responded? In Hebrews 5, 7, it says, While Jesus was here on earth, He offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue Him from death. And God heard His prayers because of His deep reverence for God. The word that's used in the Greek when it talks about Jesus' reverence for God it, it, it is a word that implies fear. Or, 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 or dread. You see, the fear of God is, is not something that you hear people talk about much anymore. No, everybody wants to talk about the love of God, you know, but nobody talks about fearing God. We want God to be a good old boy. We want God to be like somebody we can hang out with on Saturday night and toss down a few. That was not the Israelites' conception of God at all. It said that many times the people were afraid to speak the name of God because they were afraid that they'd mess it up. They were afraid that, that they, would, they would insult God by the way they said His name. We should view God as a loving God. God loves us. He loves me. He loves you. He loves all of us. But we should also know that He's a force that we should fear when our lives are not lived according to His will. When you fear something, you have reverent submission. And the proper posture as the Ark of the Covenant came into the camp would be on your knees. The proper response would be to fall down and worship. They viewed this Ark of the Covenant as the presence of God. If the presence of God comes into this place, I should be on my knees. Every 
worship service that we have here should, should include a time of joy. It can include clapping, worship, raising hands, laughing, whatever. But there should also be a time of reverence when we're quiet before the Lord. Some people think in the church that if everybody's excited about a program or, or, or this thing that, or that thing that we're going to do and we all get behind it, the church will grow. But prayer must become our focus anytime we do anything. We, we've got to pray. We've got to be reverent and submissive before the Lord. And finally, they thought somebody could take God's presence away from them. When Eli found out that, that the ark had been taken, he, he, he fell off of his chair and he broke his neck. That's how devastated he was that, that this, this ark of the covenant had been captured. Because his belief was since the ark had been captured, God would no longer be with Israel. Now, if you, if you read on a little further down in Scripture, you'll find out that wasn't the case at all. Psalm 145, 13 says, Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, forever. I've met people that thought that someone could take God's presence away from them. You know, we all have things happen. Sometimes, sometimes things happen that are, that are not pleasant. A, a, a person makes a mistake. A, a life emergency occurs that we don't expect. Then, then we seek God and we just don't find the answer. We, we don't find the answer that we thought that we'd get. Or, or, or maybe we're in a church and maybe changes are made. Maybe a new pastor comes or... Or, or, or whatever the case may be, and we're just convinced that the presence of God is gone. Maybe it could be something physical that causes concern. I, I, I seen a pulpit one time, moved out of a sanctuary, and a lady told me she was ashamed for anybody to come to the church now. You're ashamed because of a piece of furniture? Really? I knew a person who was attached to, so attached to one of the elder saints in the church that they decided when this lady died that the Spirit of the Lord had been removed from the church. Many times people place spiritual significance on a, on a person, a place, a thing. And I find that trend more so among some of the older saints, but, but some of the younger people do that too. The Bible clearly warns us against worship of idols. But I've seen times that a thing almost became a part of worship for people. <coughs> we were working around the church one day and I saw a guy came in and they, they had a communion table at the front. And one of the guys that was working around there cleaning the church or whatever, he, he set his coffee cup down on the communion table and it, and another one of the older saints tore into him. You, you would have thought he slapped his firstborn or something. God doesn't live in an object. God lives in you and me. Romans 8, 11 says, And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. It's the Spirit of the living God that brings eternal life to us. It's God's very own Spirit that occupies our hearts. We can't put Him in a box. We can't corral Jesus into a pulpit or, or, or a pew. We cannot worship a building think that our worship is pleasing to God. We're about to spend a lot of money here in the church on, on a new video system. And, and I'm praying that, that it enhances our worship. It's exactly what we need it to be. But it is not going to bring in one new person. I promise you. 
The people of Crossed are not going to gather up down on Main Street and say, did you hear about the first church of God? They got new TVs. We better run down there and see what it's all about. No one's going to come here because of that. People will come here because you invite them to come here. People will stay here because they feel God's presence in this place. How many of you said to one of your friends or your neighbors, hey, we have a new pastor at the church. Why don't you come check him out? How many of you invited someone to attend with you in the last year? You see, sometimes we become so accustomed with our own little corner of the world, we forget about everything else. The Israelites failed God because they didn't spend time in worship and prayer as they should. They failed God because they thought that someone could take God's presence from them. They worshiped an object more than they worshiped. His spirit. Where are you today? Do you regularly spend time in, in, in prayer with your Father? Do, do you place more value on, on things or a relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you think that, that something or someone has taken the presence of God out of your life? So, I assure you, He's still waiting on you. No one can take him away from you. Only you can release him. But if you feel this morning that, that that relationship needs to be stronger, if, if you wonder sometimes when God is going to show up, I invite you to come and pray with us this morning that God will be restored to your life.